So I'm not sure when the last time you may have gone to the bookstore, uh, but if you've gone to the uh, at least newish Barnes & Noble off of Kildare, they just moved out of, uh, off of Walnut Street and over to Kildare, uh, they do a great job at putting out the new books, as any bookstore would do, so that it captures your attention right away. But one of the new books that's been published within the recent months is by an author by the name of Jonathan Haidt. And uh, his last name is spelled H-A-I-D-T, uh, but it's, it's pronounced as Haidt. And the title of the book is called The Anxious Generation. I don't know how many of you have seen the book. I don't know how many of you come across it. And again, if you're more of the Amazon individual, that may be on there as well. And perhaps your phone is listening and it'll suggest it to you later today if that's what you want as well. But it's entitled The Anxious Generation. And it, if everything is to be, um, and I hadn't had a chance to cross-reference all that he provides, but so taking it on a basis of good faith, if the statistics and the numbers are to be believed, they are very startling. Even though the title says it's an anxious generation, he gives three statistics. And he divides generations by ages. And he shows the increase that since 2010 up until now of how much anxiousness and worry has increased among each generation. So if you find yourself ages 18 to 25, your age group has increased 139% with anxiousness and worry since 2010. If you find yourself in ages 26 through 34, you, have, you will find an increase of 103%. And if you find yourself in my age bracket, 35 to 49, then you, have an, you are in a 52% increase. Everybody above 50, you've decreased by 8%, so there's something going for you if you wanted to know about that. But perhaps the most startling thing about all of that is that at a result for each of those three age groups and the astronomical increase, at least per statistics are concerned, is that if ten people were just in this room, at least three to five would have to stand up as a result of being overwhelmed based on whatever it is that is going on in their life. Whether it be anxiousness, fear, whatever it may be. So if you just did the baseline and just did three, three out of ten. They're probably just in this room as we speak and as we're listening at this moment. That means that 25 of us would need to be standing up to be able to indicate and meet that we are all that we're overwhelmed. Now there's obviously going to be a time later on where our shepherds have, uh, have chosen, and good for them on being able to see the, have the foresight to do that, to lead us in a discussion on mental health on Wednesday nights in the fall, and I hope you'll join that. As we've been going through the Psalms, we've chosen each one deliberately for a variety of reasons to be able to speak through and speak to situations that we find ourselves in. Our text this morning is Psalm 55, written by King David. And I chose it because David gives us a very raw look into the inner part of his heart and his soul and his mind. And that if he were sitting in this audience, he would be one of 25 people, at the minimum, one of 25 people who would stand up and say, yeah, I may not be overwhelmed now, but there was a point in time in my life where I was overwhelmed. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 55, in the latter half of verse 2, and then the first part of verse 4, and then all of verse 5, I want you to notice how transparent and open David is with us to show us that we're not alone if we're struggling with the sense and the feeling, and at least from our perspective, the reality of being overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed by my troubles, he says. And then he gives us the symptoms of that overwhelming sense in his heart and his mind. My heart pounds in my chest. Fear and trembling 
overwhelm me. I can't stop shaking. That's a pretty powerful picture of a king. This is the man that stared down Goliath and overwhelmed him with one stone. This is a man who is able to withstand and escape not once, not twice, but three separate occasions what King Saul, his predecessor, tried to do to him. He overcame him. This is the man, this is the king, that everybody, when they put words to music, created songs that said, Saul has his thousands, but David, David has his ten thousands. Could you imagine having a song written about you, and that you have your ten thousands, the people that tried to make your life miserable, and you overcame them, and they sang about you, and they sang about you while you were alive? David had this, and he had so many other things, and yet this is a man who says, as he's writing, he's putting pen to paper in a very raw and unfiltered and transparent moment, I'm overwhelmed. I'm so overwhelmed that as I sit here with a pen in my hand, and I've got this piece of paper, and I'm writing this scroll, my heart is pounding in my chest. And this isn't an excitement. This isn't something I've looked forward to. This isn't something that I've planned. No, no, my heart is pounding within me because I am afraid. I am fearful. As a matter of fact, that's what's happening on the inside. If you could get close enough to me and I'm holding that pen, you, you'd actually see that I'm shaking. This is what this overwhelming sense is doing to me. And the way that if, you want, if you're taking notes, just very quickly as, a, as an alliteration, just to kind of put into terms that David is feeling, to condense this into three terms, David is distraught. Whatever is happening at this moment, and he's going to reveal it in just a moment in another verse, but whatever is happening, David is distraught. He is at the point, he is, he is overwhelmed. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than my family. This, this is just bigger big this is this at the moment appears to be bigger than Goliath this is just huge and as a result of how big and overwhelming this is and whatever the troubles are David says I'm also disoriented if you're putting in terms just a, as a parenthesis you're taking notes David says I'm, I'm literally at my wits end I don't know up from down I don't know left from right I know something needs to be done I don't know what it is I don't know what the solution is. I need one, but I don't know what it is. I am disoriented. Everything in my life, everything at this moment, is all chaos. Because that's what overwhelming feelings do. And David is demoralized. This is a man that is on the brink of losing all hope and all confidence. And he's writing this as a crown sits on his head, Robes are draping over his shoulders, and he has multitude of servant after servant that would get him whatever he wanted at a moment's notice. And this is how he's feeling. This is what's going on in his heart and his mind. And the question is, who or what can do this to a king? Who, who or what can do If Goliath, this is the man at 17, 18 years old, is handpicked by God, and he meets Goliath when Israel's army wouldn't dare go down in the valley. This, this is the same man. Who, who is the one that's doing this to him? And David reveals this, and he tells us. He says, I had a companion. He says, as, far, as for my companion, he betrayed his friends. He broke his promises. His words were smooth like butter, but in his heart, it's war. His words are as soothing as lotion, but underneath are daggers. In other words, at this specific moment for David, and what's overwhelmed him, two realities. One is that he had a 
a very close friend. He'll say that this friend, whomever it was, he doesn't provide a name, but he said, we, we actually walk the halls of the, of the sanctuary of God together. This is somebody I trusted. This is somebody I looked to for guidance and for help. This is somebody I looked to for, to, uh, for support and for encouragement. And whoever this individual was, he betrayed us. He broke his promises. And these words that were coming out that sounded so good to the ears, to other people, were actually just daggers to me. They just pierced me, cut me through. How can someone like this be bigger than a Goliath that David met just years earlier? And perhaps it's the far-reaching effects of what's going on in the broken trust and the love that's been abused and shattered. But what I would say is we, as David kind of gives us a specific, if we can kind of just expand for a moment, David for us in a very raw moment reveals his source of trouble. What's yours right now? If we're all a statistic to a certain extent from this point of view, 25 of us to 30 of us walked into this room with something that is overwhelming our heart and our mind. Maybe it's not somebody who's betrayed you. Maybe it is. Maybe it's somebody that you love and somebody you cherished and somebody you invested in only to find that they just returned it back to you. But instead of good, they returned evil. Maybe they failed to live up to their promise. Maybe they didn't give you what you needed. Maybe they betrayed you. Maybe it's none of that at all. Maybe it's someone else. Maybe it's just someone who just seems to be wanting to make your life miserable. Maybe it's none of that. Maybe it's things that are just happening in your life. Maybe it has something to do with your children, whether they're small or whether they're adults. Maybe you're overwhelmed by what's happening in their life and you feel powerless to stop it. You're overwhelmed. Your heart is pounding in your chest because you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And you look at your spouse, you look at your other children, you look at whomever it is that's across the dinner table, and you say, I, I just, whatever it is, I can't stop shaking. I, I can't get rid of the dread. I can't deal with being distraught. I'm so overwhelmed. Again, what do you bring in to this room today? What is that thing? Who is that person? Now, I only ask that question to get us thinking because David doesn't spend a lot of time on dealing with this individual. He recognizes something that we all have to accept as hard as it may be. And that if someone is the source of our trouble, those individuals, whether we like that or not, they have decisions and choices to make. And unfortunately, we're going to be sometimes on the receiving end of a very poor decision and a very poor choice. I wish I could say otherwise, but God gives everybody free will. That means that sometimes people are going to be on the receiving end of my poor choice and decision. I only ask that so you can identify what the source of the the problem is and being overwhelmed so that we can transition into what David does and what, we're go- what he does for the rest of the psalm and what we're going to do for the rest of our lesson. And that's simply this. we got two choices. We have two ways to handle this. David presents to us two options. So, no, there's not a whole menu that we're going to have and say pick the one that's going to be best. There's really two that he boils it down to. One is going to be wisdom that's going to come from you and from me. It's my own source of wisdom. Perhaps it may be wisdom that I find out in the world. And then the other, the other will be wisdom that is found from a God perspective. That's kind of the choice that we have. So David shows, and he begins with the very attractive one. The one that obviously, as you'll see, it'll provide an instantaneous relief for you. And it would provide an instantaneous relief for me. And it's rooted in a wisdom that on some occasions it worked. Actually, there is a story in the Old Testament of a man who employed this wisdom and it worked for him from a God perspective. But for the most part, those who use this wisdom, they end up finding matters to be a whole lot worse if they use this wisdom. 
This is what David says. At this particular moment, with hands shaking and heart pounding, if I could have wings like a dove, I would fly away and I would rest. I would fly away to the quiet of the wilderness. How quickly, how quickly I would escape. Far from this storm of hatred. Two times. If I could just fly away, I'd do that. You wouldn't even have to ask me twice. All you would have to say is, hey, David, do you want to get away? Absolutely, sign me up, tell me when and where. I won't even pack a bag. I'll just buy what I need when we get to wherever we're going. If I could fly away from it, I would. And actually, that wisdom worked for Joseph, didn't it? Now, granted, he paid a price because Potiphar's wife turned the tables, unfortunately and sadly, on him, and he had to pay a dear price. An innocent had to suffer, but... But he did not sin because he ran away. What happens when you can't run away? See, running away looks a little bit different for us because while we literally can't, we'll change. So I I won't run away maybe in the way that Joseph will run away, but you know what, I'll, I'll just change my job. Well, what happens when you can only change your job so many times? You know what? My marriage isn't working, so I'll run away. I'll find someone else. What happens when you can't do that? You know what? We'll just move. Down the street, down the block, new city. What happens when you can only move so many times? In other words, there is a time in which you need to run away, and then there are times when you can't. Others of us will run away, not necessarily by changing jobs or changing friends, but we'll run away by shutting everybody else out. We won't answer the call anymore. We won't respond to the text. The email will go unanswered. We'll just create this little black hole, and nothing, everything will be come in, but nothing will come out. We'll just, we'll just shut everyone out. David says that actually is a very attractive way of handling things. If I can just get away. Because at the end of that, notice what he says at the end of verse 6. Rest. I, I want my heart to stop pounding. I actually want it to beat normally for a little while. I want my hand to stop shaking so that I can write and I can eat and I can do all of that so I'm, I'm just not shaking with fear and with dread. At the end of verse 7, I, give me the quiet of the wilderness. I, Israel did all that she could to avoid the wilderness, and you and I do all that we can. David says, I'd actually embrace it at this moment. I am so distraught and I'm so overwhelmed. Put me in the desert and I will find quiet and I'll find rest. Sounds good, doesn't it? And it's very attractive. Except for those that we read about in the Scripture who employed this, and it didn't work out so well for them. You know who I'm thinking of? This week I reflected a lot on Elijah. Elijah is the man who threw courage and did so many great things, but perhaps the greatest is that one man against 400. Right? One man against 400. Prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Baal versus one prophet of God. The odds are all against him. But this is a man who not only is courageous, but he knows. He is full of confidence. He knows what God can do. And God doesn't let him down. And as we know the story, the very next chapter is is that Jezebel, the leader of these prophets, puts a bounty on his head. What does Elijah do? He runs away. Now, again, the attractiveness is, well, if he runs away, he's going to lose. If he doesn't run away, he's going to lose his head. But when he does run away... He almost loses his faith. And it takes God through miraculous signs to wake him up. When Elijah runs away, when he flies away to the wilderness, when he employs what David said, if I could do that, I would. There's a man in the Bible who actually did it, and when he did it, he almost lost his faith. He struggled. Mightily he struggled. 
even believing that he was the only one. Nobody else is going to deal with this. There's no one else like me. And that's the thing about it is, is that whatever you brought in here, maybe the option and maybe the wisdom is to run away, but we can only run away so many, we can only fly away so many times. Okay, well, if I can't do that, what am I supposed to do? Because this, this isn't going away. I will call on God. I will call on God. And the Lord will rescue me. And the reason I chose Psalm 55 isn't just simply for the fact that David is going to teach us about prayer, but he tells us the prayer. It's recorded for us. Listen to my prayer is how the entire psalm begins. Listen to my prayer, O God. Don't ignore my cry for help. Please listen to me. Please answer me. Morning, noon, night, I cry out in my distress. You hear David that as raw and as transparent and as open and as honest as he is with his sense of overwhelming, instead of running away in the face of the distress and the problems, David runs to God. David knows something about this and he runs there. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't meet us because we know that God met Elijah even though Elijah ran away. This isn't about God, as much as it is about how we respond to the things in our life. Why pray? If prayer isn't going to change the heart and the mind of my enemy, who is, whose words are like daggers to my heart, and who's creating all of this overwhelming sense of dread and distraught and disorientation and so forth and so on, then why pray? Because what I want to pray for is that person to go away, and tonight we'll talk about that. Because David does pray that actual prayer. But at the moment, that's not going to happen. So what, what is it that I pray for? Because I want the problem to go away. If I can't go away, I want God to take it away. And true, sometimes God does take things away. And then sometimes He doesn't. And that's the other reason in choosing this prayer. In choosing this psalm. See, prayer does a couple of things for us. One is that prayer puts things in perspective for us. When you're overwhelmed by something, when you're disoriented by something or someone, things get all out of perspective. It gets big. And the more we feed it, the bigger it gets. And the more we feed it, the bigger it gets. Is there anything bigger than God as of today? And yet, if we're overwhelmed, we can easily fall into the thinking and the believing that this, this is bigger than Him. Prayer also challenges the assumptions that come, come along with problems and troubles. I'm assuming that not only is this problem big, but I'm also assuming that there is no solution to it. Israel knew this and operated by this. This is why she was paralyzed by Goliath. This is why he had so, many, uh, so much confidence to go out every day at the first thing in the morning and challenge Israel. Is there not a person out here who can challenge me? Is there not anybody who is among Israel that's going to come down and fight me? He taunts Israel day and night. And Israel starts operating and living by the assumption that Goliath is too big and too strong. The ten spies with Joshua and Caleb, the ten spies. Yeah, the land is great and it's exactly what God said. But I'll also tell you this, compared to them, we're like grasshoppers. They're giants and we're grasshoppers, right? So grasshopper, meat, boot, that's us. That's what they're going to do. It's, we assume something about the problem. We assume something about the distress. Prayer reminds you and me of the reality. And what is real, and what will always be real, is what is written in the book that you hold in your hands. And prayer reminds you of the God who wrote that book, and the God who produced that book, and the God who gave the promises in that book. And prayer also invites God into the issue. It invites God into the problem. It invites God into the situation. So listen to my prayer, he says. Don't ignore me. Please listen and answer me. 
morning, noon, and night I cry out in my distress. And I know you may be thinking, as I have before, and probably others who have come before us, and probably others who will come after us. The problems never cease. They just seem to be ceaseless. I remember reading somewhere in the New Testament that we are to pray without ceasing. Your problems may be ceaseless. uh, ceaseless. They never stop. That's okay. Because you don't have to stop praying either. You know, the Bible will tell us that God did not need what you and I needed last night. Whether you got an hour, or whether you got a full eight, or maybe you got twelve. God did not need a time to sleep. David looks at it and says, I can pray at any time. There's only so many times I can run away. There's only so many times I can fly away. There's only so many times that I can go away. There is never a limit to how many times that I can pray to God. Never a limit. And so I'm going to pray. These are my two options. I know one offers a temporary relief, and I know the other offers a true, lasting relief. So I'm going to choose what right now is the harder of the two. But it's because I got a big God and I got a big picture in mind. And so he says what was read for us. Give your burdens to the Lord, and He'll take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and to fall. Now, part of this in terms of the promise, as I mentioned, that so many of us struggle with praying, especially about giving the burden, is because it just doesn't go away. Especially if it's rooted in a person and not an event or circumstance. The promise here is not that God will take away the problem. The promise is, is that God will carry you through it, whatever it is. That's why the more traditional versions that you have, He will sustain you as you go through whatever it may be. Well, what if I need it at 4 o'clock in the afternoon? That's a great time to pray. What if I don't know at 1 a.m. when everything seems to be so big and my mind can't turn off? That's a good time to pray. Give your burdens to the Lord. And He'll take care of you. Peter will quote this in his letter to a group of Christians who've been scattered to the four winds of the Roman Empire. So much on their plate. So much against them. But he'll say this toward the end of the letter. Give all of your worries and all of your cares to God because He cares for you. One of the great songs that we have in our hymn books, Faith and Praise, is Does Jesus Care? Do you know the song? Know the hymn? And the entire song, I enjoy it. It's one of my personal favorites when talking about this subject. Because it forces us to ask the question, and it forces us to acknowledge the answer. Does Jesus care? Does God care? Yes, He cares. I know He cares. The Word tells me He cares. And the Word doesn't tell me He cares by whisking away the problem. Jesus' cup did not pass. Paul's thorn was not taken away. Sometimes the trouble, sometimes the overwhelming aspect, whatever the source is, it isn't going to go away. But that's okay. Because God was with Jesus, and God was with Paul, and God was with David, and God was with Elijah, and God is with you. Wherever you are and whatever it is that you're dealing with, And as far as our Lord is concerned, if He was big enough and He was strong enough to carry a cross for the entire world, He's big enough and strong enough to carry whatever burden you've got. So give all of your worries and all of your cares. He cares about you. So Paul would put it this way in Romans 8. He who did not spare His own Son for us, how will He withhold anything for you? I'm paraphrasing. It's Romans 8. But if that happens to be your favorite verse or one that you lean on, the ultimate picture that we are to put in our heart and our mind of how we know that God cares and why we continue to pray when it looks hopeless and full of distraught and we're disoriented and we're overwhelmed, 
says, He who did not spare His own Son for your sake, how will He spare or how will He withhold anything that you need today? And the answer is, He doesn't. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful to everything and for everything You give us. We are most grateful for prayer. We're reminded that we're able to approach Your throne of grace and mercy in our time of need and our time of help. Because Your Son sits at Your right hand and He lives right now to make intercession for us. Oh, we're not worthy to enter into Your presence, but because we're washed in His blood, and because when You see us, You actually see Him because we have been clothed with Him, You're able to hear our prayer. And You provide for us what we need. Oh, we tell You what we want and You welcome that. But You, in Your infinite wisdom and Your infinite goodness, will give us what we need. Give us the strength to run to You and not run away when it comes to trouble. Give us the humility to fall on our knees before Your throne and trust that You will provide exactly what we need. And the reason we can do that is because when we were running away from You so long ago, You did not spare Your Son on the cross, but You gave Him up for us all. If You were that good and that gracious when we were not even looking for You, how good and gracious will You be today if we will seek You with all of our heart and all of our mind? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to respond to the Lord today. To respond to Him that the greatest burden that you may have in your life actually may not have to do with anybody other than yourself and perhaps the sin that has been committed. And yet, in the goodness and the gracious of God, He provides His Son. Our encouragement to you is that if today is the day to run towards the Son and find freedom and find uh, uh, perfection in Him, then do so. And arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. If we can help you in any way this morning, why don't you come as we stand and sing?